Well, good morning and welcome to Cross Community Church. I need to make a little, uh, I don't know, apology to you. Uh, yesterday I was at a very significant and momentous and defining event. That's kind of a, like a stamp on a, the, it's, it's the period at the end of a very long sentence. Uh, I was at the Bedlam game. Go Pokes, got to win, and so my voice is a little little hoarse today, uh, but I'm glad to be back here with you and preaching for you today. We're continuing our series called Jesus Is, where we're teaching you who Jesus is through the context and the characters of the Old Testament. And so we began in week one with Father Abraham, and what we said about him is that Jesus is greater than Abraham. And then we took a look at the life of Moses, and Jesus is greater than Moses. And today, we're going to be looking at the Old Testament character, King David, who's the most famous king over all of Israel. Uh, He's mentioned over a thousand times throughout the Scripture. So just a little side note, I'm not about to tell you everything about David's life. There's no way I could possibly cover all of the content. And so if you want to dig in and kind of know the bulk of David's life, uh, you could could get a really good uh, perspective, first and second. Like Samuel, but then you're going to need to read most of the Psalms as well. Uh, David, there, there's a whole lot of material about his life. And so if you do want to read, again, First and Second Samuel will get you a pretty good primer on, on the life of David, but there's much more than even I'm going to cover today and what you'll even get in those books. Okay, what I want to do today is give you three significant um, things that happened in the life of David. Uh, maybe the most significant things, maybe not. You could disagree with me there. Uh, But I want to kind of three significant moments in the life of David, and then I want to contrast his life with Jesus to show you that Jesus is indeed a greater David. So uh, we begin in David's life really not with his birth. We don't know much about his birth other than his father was Jesse, who was in the line of Judah. We know that David had eight brothers and sisters and that he was the youngest And so kind of to give you the setting, um, Israel has a great king, and his name is Saul. Uh, They wanted the king from God. God had given them King Saul. Uh, The problem with Saul is that he didn't obey the Lord, and God was ultimately going to reject him as king. But while he was still king, God sends his prophet Samuel to the house of Jesse and says, Samuel, uh, I want you to go and anoint the son of Jesse to be king, uh, the one that I'm going to point out to you. And so Samuel, the prophet, goes to, am I? I'm, yeah, Samuel, I'm sorry. I thought I was getting confused about my names there. Uh, goes to the house of Jesse, and he starts looking at the various sons. And so one by one, they're, they're coming by him. And he looks at the oldest son of Jesse. He's like, no, this is, this is not the one that God's appointed. And then the next son came by, still not the one that God appointed. And, and really what Jesse did was he ran all of his sons past the prophet and still again, none of these are the guy. And so finally the prophet looks at Jesse and says, do you have any other sons? And Jesse says, well, there, there is one more. He's, he's off tending the sheep. Now we don't know um, a whole lot about the situation. We're not told exactly how old David was, but it doesn't say a lot about what your dad thinks of you when a prophet says, I'm going to come anoint one of your sons king, and he doesn't even come, he doesn't even call you to come in to see if you might be the one, right? And so Samuel's like, hey, if you've got another son, go ahead and call him in from watching over the, sh- the sheep. And sure enough, as David comes before the prophet, he says, this is the one whom God has chosen. And so really the first major event of David's life was that he was anointed king by Samuel. And Samuel took a horn of oil and he anointed them. And by the way, in front of all of his brothers there with his father and all their household. I don't know how you would have handled that as a young boy, but if I got anointed king, uh, even over my one sister, I would have been rubbing that in, right? So here's David, um, eight other brothers and sisters, or eight other brothers. He's the one who is anointed to be king. Uh, but the, the, the significant part about this is that he was anointed king long before he would ever be appointed king. Saul is still the king over Israel. And so here's David. He's been called by God to do this thing, to be the king. He's been anointed, told this is what's coming. But he's got to go back out and watch the sheep. And it probably didn't feel like what he'd hoped it would feel like, you know. Like, all right, I've just been anointed king, and now I get to return to watching sheep. And day after day after day after day, year after year after year, David, who's been anointed king by the prophet of God, 
is waiting until he's ultimately going to be appointed. Um, But that wouldn't happen until many years later. David was 30 years old before he was appointed king over first Judah and then ultimately over the nation of Israel. So there's a big gap between anointing and appointing there. The second major thing I want you to know about David's life is that David was a mighty warrior. And I don't want you to lose sight of how profound this was. We don't really live in a warrior culture anymore. We don't celebrate people that have, you know, gone out and and just killed a lot of other people. Luckily, we don't fight wars against our neighbors all that often. We do celebrate our soldiers. We want to do that. But um, different day. David was hailed as a mighty warrior. So after he's been anointed, his brothers, they get called to go off to war. Now, fighting-aged men in Israel were likely 20 years old and older. David is somewhere still under the age of 20. His brothers go off to war to fight alongside King Saul as they fight against the Philistines. David gets to be the errand boy. His father sends him with some provision for his brothers. And as David arrives on the scene where the Israel is lined up in array against the armies of the Philistines, uh, the champion named Goliath, he comes out and he defies the armies of the living God. And he says, hey, send out a man to fight against me. It would be a, a kind of a winner-take-all fight to the death rather than both armies clashing um, One man from each side would fight and win or take all. David hears this. It's the 40th consecutive day that Goliath has come out to taunt and really to mock the armies of Israel, the armies of the living God. And while for 40 days the fighting men of Israel, King Saul, had done absolutely nothing, David, upon hearing this, he volunteers to go and to fight. Now, King Saul, knowing the implications uh, and how significant this is, that uh, he's going to send a warrior out to match up against Goliath, he's, he's a little hesitant. He wants to size David up a bit. Now, just to, to kind of let you know uh, about Goliath and let you know where the Israelite army was, 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 11, it tells us that the Israel, Israelite army was dismayed and greatly afraid. Again, the fighting men have seen Goliath. They're like, there's no chance. I'm winning that one. They're dismayed and greatly afraid. By the way, just so you know, um, Goliath was nine feet, nine inches tall. He had a suit of armor that weighed 125 pounds, and the tip of his spear weighed an additional 15 pounds. Y'all, I graduated high school Weighing 140 pounds. He's got more armor and weaponry than I was when I grabbed. This was a really giant man and a ferocious warrior. Uh, So much so that when Saul calls David to come before him to see who this person is that's volunteered to go out and fight Goliath, he, he points out, he's like, Goliath has been a warrior since his youth, and you're still a youth. You're a young boy. It was likely that David was somewhere between 15 and 19 years old at this point. But David begins to to talk to Saul, and he says, Hey, while I was watching my father's sheep, a lion and then a bear came after him. And it was the Lord who who empowered me to deliver the sheep from that first lion and then from the bear. Like, I've seen God fight for me. God is with me. Kind of, I can do this, Saul. And Saul, hearing that the Lord had been with David... He first tries to outfit him with a set of armor, but David, being the young, non-trained warrior, couldn't function very well with a suit of armor, and he couldn't wield the sword very well, but he sets out to face Goliath. He gave up the suit of armor and the sword, and instead he goes out with his staff, a sling, and five smooth stones. And he did so to demonstrate to all of the earth that there is a God in Israel and that the Lord saves not with sword or spear, for the battle is his. Again, don't miss this. Nine feet, nine inches tall, 140 pounds of armor and weaponry at his disposal, a hardened warrior since the days of his youth. And then you got David with a staff and a sling, and five smooth stones. If you're not following along in the story here, there is no chance that David should win this battle. 
And I believe that was on purpose. God wanted to demonstrate that he is the Lord of the battle. So as David goes out to meet Goliath, Goliath begins to advance against him. And David picks up the pace and he runs to meet Goliath. And he takes one of the stones and he places it in his sling. And he slings it at Goliath. And it hits him in the forehead. The scriptures tell us it's sunk into his forehead. And Goliath falls face down. And David rushes forward, grabs Goliath's sword, and cuts off his head. Now, I don't know what, what happened, but I'm guessing that all across the armies of Israel, Saul and everyone who involved, there was this total exhale, this like, oh, like this sigh of relief, because they probably thought there was no chance that this would ever happen. And yet on that day, all of the armies of Israel, those who had trembled in fear at hearing the taunts of Goliath, those men, those other warriors uh, who had armor, who had swords, who were still afraid to go fight Goliath, they saw that it is the Lord who fights for his people, that the battle belongs to him. And so Saul and all of the armies, in seeing that God was with David, Saul appoints him as the head over all of his army, and he begins to lead Saul's or the armies of Israel in battle. And every battle, David's winning victory after victory after victory. I mean, he, he's, he's winning extraordinary battles that he shouldn't win all through the power of of God. And when David returned home, the women would come out singing and dancing in, in the streets, and they would sing the song that Saul has struck down his thousands, but David his tens of thousands, which sets the stage for some difficult relationships between, or relations between Saul and David. But I want you to know that David was a mighty warrior who was empowered by God. He'd, be, he'd received God's Holy Spirit. It had come upon him at his anointing, and it showed up as he fought against Goliath and in these other battles. Now, the third thing that I want you to see about David, and then we'll kind of jump into the comparisons, is that David was a repentant king. After the death of Saul, David was finally crowned king, first of Judah and then over all of Israel. But David was not like Saul, who was rejected for failing to keep God's commands. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, David is described by God as a man after God's own heart. He loved God and sought to honor God in all that he did. He brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel and danced before it as it was brought into the city of Jerusalem. 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 15 tells us that David reigned over all of Israel and he administered justice and equity to his people. David was a good king. It wasn't just the rich who were favored. It wasn't just the poor. David administered justice and equity to everyone. He showed kindness to Mephibosheth, who was the son of his good friend named Jonathan, who was the son of Saul. And he cared for everyone within his kingdom. But David wasn't perfect. And one year, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab in his place, the commander of his armies, and sent him to go out and lead the armies in his place. And one evening, while loitering on the roof of his palace, he looks down and he sees a woman bathing her name was Bathsheba. And David looked at her, and he lusted after her. And he sent for her, and he took her. And he brought her into his house, and he slept with her. And when he found out that she was pregnant, he tried to cover it up. He sent for her husband, Uriah, who was fighting for the armies of God. And he had him brought home, and he got him drunk. And he sent him in to say, hey, go sleep with your wife. And when he honorably refused to do so, David sent him back to the battle with orders to place him in the place of the heaviest fighting and to withdraw from him so that he would be struck down. David not only committed adultery with Bathsheba, he had her husband killed to try to cover it up. And after Uriah was killed... David took Bathsheba to be his wife, maybe thinking everything's going to be fine now. 
The second Samuel, verse 11, 27, says, tells us that the thing that David had done, it displeased the Lord. David had grieved the heart of God. And so God sent his prophet Nathan to David. And Nathan was like, hey, David, I just want to tell you a little story here. So there were, there were two men. Uh, one man was really rich. He had lots of flocks and herds. He was a really wealthy guy. Kind of had it all going on, the life you want to live. Um, and then there was another guy that you wouldn't want to be. <clears throat> this guy had only one little ewe lamb, and he loved this lamb. He treated it like a daughter. It ate from his hand. It drank from his cup. It even slept in his arms. He loved this little lamb like a daughter. Well, one day a traveler comes to town and goes to stay at the home of the rich man. And the rich man realizes, oh, it's customary for me to feed a meal here. And rather than taking a lamb from his abundant flocks and herds, he decides instead to take the little lamb from the man who had just that one little ewe lamb. He has it prepared. He serves it to his guest. King David, upon hearing the story, he's angry, as he should have been. He says, the man who has done this deserves to die and he should be forced to repay fourfold everything that he's taken. And the prophet Nathan looks at him and says, David, you're that man. And King David, who had followed God, but now failed miserably and sinned against him, is confronted with his own sin. It must have been difficult for the prophet Nathan, knowing that this is the king, right? He, his life could be in jeopardy for, for coming and being faithful to share with the king about his sin. But Nathan doesn't, or I'm sorry, David doesn't kill the prophet. Instead, he takes his word to heart. And after some time, David did indeed repent from his sin. 2 Samuel 12, 13 tells us that David acknowledged his sin before God. And if you read Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, you see God or David pouring out his heart in repentance before the Lord. David wasn't perfect, but he was repentant. So there are several similarities between David and Jesus, just as we saw with Abraham and Moses and Jesus. Both David and Jesus were descendants of Abraham, pretty common in the lineage of Jesus. You're going to see a lot of that. Both men were born in Bethlehem and ultimately died in Jerusalem. Both men were shepherds. While King David began his earthly reign uh, at age 30, Jesus began his earthly ministry at age 30. Both David and Jesus experienced adversity in the wilderness. David with the lion and the bear as he defended his father's sheep, and Jesus Adversity in the wilderness when he was tempted by Satan. Both men were betrayed by a close friend. David was betrayed by Ahithophel, who conspired against him with David's son Absalom. And Jesus was betrayed by Judas, who conspired with the chief priests and Pharisees to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Both men wept on the Mount of Olives over tragic circumstances that were happening in Jerusalem. And both men triumphed over their enemies, David over Goliath, and Jesus over Satan. But I want to be very clear for you today. Jesus is greater than David in every way. While David may have been a great king over Israel, Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. David was a man after God's own heart. Jesus is fully God who took on flesh and made his dwelling among us. David defeated Goliath and rescued the armies of Israel, but Jesus defeated sin and Satan and rescued his people from certain death. David ministers justice and equity to the earthly kingdom of Israel, while Jesus establishes and upholds his heavenly kingdom with justice and righteousness. David was an imperfect king. But Jesus was perfect in every way. While David selfishly stole another man's wife and had her husband killed to try to cover it up, Jesus selflessly laid down his own life for his bride, 
the church in order that we may have life. David prophesied about Jesus, and Jesus fulfilled that prophecy. David died and was buried. Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose again on the third day. Jesus is greater than David. In Psalm 110, David said, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David called Jesus Lord. And then in Psalm 95, David called on all of God's people, the Israelites of the Old Testament, and believers now in the context of the New Testament. And here's what David called us to do in response to who Jesus is. I want to read Psalm 95 for you again. David wrote, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hands. And then he implored us, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today, the message is not for you to be more like David and go slay your Goliaths. The message is to worship and bow down before the King of kings, the Lord our God, our creator, the maker of heaven and earth. The message is do not harden your hearts, but instead to open your hearts to Jesus and respond to him in faith. He's a greater king than David. He's a greater shepherd. He's a greater father. The message is to entrust yourself to God, who is sovereign over all and perfectly good. Today I want to share with you just uh, three applications for us as we look at the life of David and, and Jesus. And we seek to live as the people of God, as his church to live out the lives that God has, has, has placed for us to live. Um, the first thing that I want to say to you is um, maybe today you need to remember that your battle belongs to the Lord. I don't know what you may be going through. I don't know what circumstances you might be facing or what circumstances you may face tomorrow. I don't know the difficulties that you endure but when David wrote Psalm 95 that we just read, that we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hands, I can't help but think that David was likely thinking back to when he was a shepherd over his father's sheep, where he lived with them and spent every day with them, watching over them and caring for him. I can't help but think that David thought back to when he had risked his own life to save his sheep from the paw of the bear and then the lion. And David is writing to us to remind us that our God cares for us just like he cared for those sheep. That you may not see it right now. You may not, not know what God is doing, but that he cares for you. We are the people of God's pasture and the sheep of his hands. Your Father in heaven, He sees your circumstances. He sees your situation. And He wants to work on your behalf. He doesn't always work in the way that we think that He should, but He definitely is at work. God wants us to trust Him and to entrust ourselves to His watchful hands, to let Him fight for us just as He fought for David. David pointed out when he slew Goliath, that the Lord slay, saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is his. I don't know about you, but God doesn't always work the way that I think he should. 
when I see a problem, I'll, I really I look for a solution. I want it to be fixed. And I think, oh, God, here's exactly what you should do. We're reminded that God often works in ways that we don't understand. He doesn't always save with a sword and spear. But we can trust in the fact that the battle belongs to him. Listen, God didn't send a young boy who didn't know how to wear armor or wield a, a sword against a nine-foot, nine-inch tall giant with 140 pounds of armor and weaponry against him. He didn't send that young boy against this massive giant for no reason. God did it to demonstrate that the battle belongs to him. And if the battle between David and Goliath belongs to the Lord, the battle that you may be facing, your circumstances, your difficulty, the sickness, It belongs to the Lord. He is sovereign over every circumstance and over every detail. And our invitation as his people is just to respond in faith to him. God wants us to trust him, to rest in his power and his sovereign plan. Our temptation is to be like those fighting men of Israel. To be fearful, to tremble, to be afraid. What's going to happen? But God wants us to respond in faith and to trust him to work on our behalf. Maybe for you today, you need to remember that your battle belongs to the Lord. Respond in faith rather than fear to him. The second thing that I would want to point out to you is maybe you're in a season of waiting. There was at least a decade between the time of David's anointing and when he was actually appointed as king. And maybe you find yourself in a similar period. You probably haven't been anointed king, uh, but maybe for you this is a season of waiting. And it's a difficult season of waiting. And it seems to go on and on and on. But for David, between his anointing and appointing was an extended season of preparation. Where David was spending day after day out with his sheep. He was serving in Saul's household. Oftentimes uh, he was a target of Saul's anger. In the season between his anointing and appointing, David faced an enormous amount of adversity. But that was so that David could get to know God as his shepherd. And to learn to walk with God, not just on the mountaintops, but also as they walk through the valley of the shadow of death. If you're in a season of waiting, I believe God's delay is deliberate. And he's using this time to teach you about himself, to teach you to trust him and to walk with him through the good and through the bad. Once again, trust our good shepherd who ultimately is leading us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The final thing that I want to point out to you today is we look at the life of David and Jesus we can be reminded that our past doesn't define us. David was an adulterer, a murderer, and a rapist. He took Bathsheba against her will and had her husband murdered to cover it up. And those are some heavy labels to wear. But you know, when God spoke about David, he didn't call him an adulterer or a murderer or a rapist. He called him a man after his own heart. What we can see here is that because of Jesus Christ, there's no place that we can go that God's grace won't meet us there. There's no thing that we can do that God's grace isn't greater. There's no place where you have been That God wasn't with you in that moment. The scriptures tell us that God demonstrated his own love for us in this. That while we were still yet sinners, Jesus, knowing all of your sin, he chose to die for you. And that Jesus went to the cross bearing all of our sins. Our sin and our shame and our guilt. And Jesus went to the cross and God poured out the just punishment for our sin on his son. We 
owed a debt that we couldn't pay. And Jesus paid it in full. And there as he was breathing his last breaths, he cried out, It is finished. Our debt of sin has been canceled. Our past no longer defines us. You are not your sin. You're not your shame. You're not the thing that you once did. If you have come to faith in Jesus Christ, you are now a child of the living God. Jesus died on the cross so that you could become a new creation. And there is now therefore no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. We should no longer be burdened by the weight of our sins, but instead carried by the grace of our great God. Today is a new day. For those of us who have come to faith in Jesus, he's taken our sins away. Our past no longer defines us. We are now the people of God, sons and daughters of the living God. David, upon hearing the words of the prophet Nathan, he declared himself, the man who did this deserves to die. And many of us, if we think about our own sin, if we read the word, we know that our sin deserved death. And Jesus took that punishment for us. Not so that we would still stay in slavery to sin or pretend like we're still condemned men and women, but so that we could live new life in him, free from sin and free from death. Jesus died for us. And in so doing, demonstrated his extraordinary love for you and for me. Maybe today you just need to remember that your battle belongs to the Lord. And you just need to walk through what you're going through in faith. Lori mentioned in the first service that throughout the Psalms, you'll see David. He's writing about his problems. And he's writing about how he thinks God should respond and often asking, God, how long are you going to delay? But then if you continue to read the Psalms, you'll see God's deliverance of David. And he reminds himself of who God is and how he works. Sometimes we have to do the same. Maybe for you today in this season of waiting, it's just a time of trust. And God's teaching you who he is and you need to respond in faith. And maybe for you, you need to remember that your past doesn't define you. And like King David, maybe for you, today is just a day of repentance where you acknowledge your sin before God and you just ask God to forgive you, that you trust in his death on the cross and his burial and his resurrection to save you from your sin and the the punishment that you may even believe that you deserve and instead to give you new life in him. Today, I want to remind you of the words of David. If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, but respond in obedience to Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me? God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you've been revealing yourself to us from the very beginning of Scripture to the very end. God, that you were revealing your nature and your character and your goodness to us. God, we thank you that you're a greater David, a greater king, a greater shepherd, a greater father. Lord, may we respond in faith and trust to you. May we give you your due worship. May we honor you as our king. And Lord, we just pray that you would have your way in us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.